This is Heartrepreneur Radio, maximizing your personal and business results by leading with your heart. With your host, Terry Levine. Listen every week as Terry tackles the topics that will help you become a successful heart centered entrepreneur. Be sure to read the blog posts at www.heartrepreneur.com slash blog. Come back often and add this show to your favorite RSS feed or subscribe in iTunes. You can also follow Terry on Twitter at Mentor Terry and on Facebook.com slash Heartrepreneur Terry Levine. And now here's Terry. Hello and welcome to Heartrepreneur Radio and TV show with uh, Terry Levine. I am your co-host, Velma Gallant. And I'm happy to be here today. You can connect with Terry, me, and other like-minded heart-based business owners at the Terry Levine, at the Heartpreneurs with Terry Levine Facebook group. So definitely go check it out. We hope you find value from our show. We'd love to have you subscribe, like our shows, and we always love those five dark, five-star reviews. Today's quote, music gives a soul to the universe, wings to the mind, flight to the imagination, and life to everything, Plato. Today's show topic is how a DJ set is very similar to growing a business, and our special guest this week is Amani Roberts. Amani is a DJ, music producer, author, professor, and hardcore creative who blends his love for music and education into unique experiences daily in our online and offline worlds. Originally from Washington, D.C., Imani has worked for over 25 years in the hospitality world and over 13 years as a professional DJ. His most recent book, DJs Mean Business, takes you behind the DJ booth and shows how each time period of the night closely relates to growing a business. Driven by the famous African proverb, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. I'm really happy to introduce Amani Roberts to you. Welcome to the show, Amani. Thank you very much, Vilma. I'm happy to be here. So tell me a little bit. So I know that um, clearly you have a passion for music and DJing and connecting to people because to me DJing and music is actually a way to really connect with your audience I would love to hear how you made the connection between DJing and building a business how those two things are actually related I was looking at just similarities between business and DJing because as a DJ we are business people and we have to kind of do many different aspects of our business from the genesis of our business to helping it and watching it grow to just maintaining it. And that's very similar to a DJ set where you first start off, if it's 10 p.m., you're just kind of getting started, warming up the crowd to encountering some sort of resistance issues, whether it be with the equipment or the crowd, fighting through that because through it all, the music is not allowed to stop, so you must keep going. And then um, just continuing to take advantage when you do hit peak sales and keeping that going, which for us would be peak time. The dance floor is packed. Everyone's happy singing, dancing, uh, crying maybe. <laughs> um, and just continuing to kind of go throughout the night and just closing out the night well. I saw some similarities. So I tried to describe what it would be like to be a DJ in a club from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. But related to business because there are some similarities that would not first come to mind. Okay, so I heard you talk about the genesis, which is the, the, the beginning of the night or the beginning of your business growing, um, which, you know, is really easy for me to connect to growing your business and then maintaining your business. What do you mean by growing when it comes to your DJ and what's the connection that you made there? So you want to grow your audience so you have more people uh, coming to your events. You want to grow your business so you get to do bigger, more high profile events at higher revenue. You want to grow personally your DJ skills, whether it be certain scratching techniques, mixing techniques, beat juggling, your catalog of music. Uh, there's always room for growth. You want to be able to grow to be able to play not only with other DJs, but maybe with other musicians. So there's, there's always different great growth opportunities. You want to grow so you can perform not only in your home city, but at cities all around the country and then all around the world. So when I think of growth, 
that's that's what I'm thinking about in terms of, of DJ life. You want to grow and play bigger, better festival events. There's just massive opportunity for growth. And that's what comes to mind when I think about it in terms of a DJ. Okay. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. So growing your audience, your events, your um, your music library, which to me would kind of relate to uh, your product base as well. Um, I also heard you talk about grow- growing collaboration with o- other DJs. And I think that's a really important part of growing any business is to find ways to be able to collaborate with other people. I mean, that goes to um, what you talked about, what we talked about in your introduction about the African proverb, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Yes, I think, you know, I grew up playing competitive sports. And, you know, there's really only one winner, one loser at the end of the game. And initially you might think that business is that way, but that's probably not the best way to grow your business. You can only grow by yourself so far. You're going to need to collaborate with different people across different uh, demographic groups, across different industries. So as a DJ, if you're able to collaborate with other DJs who could have a bigger presence in a different area of the world or could be skilled in a different area than you, it's just going to help. It helps and it'll help you get further. I've gotten further in my career quicker by collaborating with other DJs, meeting other DJs, inviting DJs to collaborate with me, um, networking with other people. If I had just stayed in my own little box, I would not be as far as I am today. Okay. And I, and I love that you... You brought in kind of the sports reference because what what I'm kind of hearing is that uh, business, DJ music, it, it isn't a sport per se, but it's more like a production. And so when we bring in those team, that team together or those partners, um, you actually get the opportunity to um, create more visibility, a bigger you're playing in a bigger theater, right? Um, You're playing in a bigger dance hall, you're playing bigger events. And you just, it just gives you that opportunity to play bigger in your business. Exactly. And, you know, the DJ world, it can be very competitive, it can be very cutthroat. But the road that I'm trying to walk down and to kind of live my life and business wise, the road of collaboration. And I feel and I've seen that I'll get much further going down that road than kind of being stuck in the old school way of thinking in terms of just competitiveness and trying to, you know, be at the top, but be alone. Right. Right. And that makes, that makes a lot of sense as well. So tell me a little bit about your book. Um, I want to hear, I want to hear your favorite chapter in there. The one that you (laughs) most love to share with your audience. Okay, well, well, if I could, I'll share with you one and a half. So my favorite okay. chapter is probably the troubleshooting chapter. I think that out of all the classes I took when I went to Scratch Academy, this one continues to this day to be the most beneficial one. Troubleshooting is just something goes wrong in the DJ booth, whether you're in a club, a bar, you're at a corporate event, you're live streaming a DJ set, like something will always go wrong. A microphone is off, computer crashes, there's lighting doesn't work. There's always issues, but you have to be uh, flexible enough and you have to be able to manage your emotions enough to troubleshoot on the fly while music is still playing because you never want to let the crowd know that there's an issue. You definitely don't want to let you know your client know that there's an issue. You just have to kind of keep it going. And that lesson and those lessons apply to businesses in so many ways because in business, most businesses start off with one idea in mind, like, okay, we're going to be a computer company. Let's talk about Apple. We're going to do personal computers, computer company. And then there comes a time period where maybe the computer business is not going well, but Apple just can't shut down because you already have customers that are your, your computer customers. So Mm -hmm. then they have to shift and adjust on the fly. And then they become a technology company where it's like they have the iPhone and they completely change the mobile phone game. And then they add in music things like that. So they've completely shifted their company into a different type of business, but they never stop working. Same thing in the DJ world where we have to shift and change and adjust and troubleshoot on the fly, but the music can never stop. And so that's my favorite chapter. And then the part, the second one would be just feedback. It's very, very hard, you know, for creatives to take feedback because we're very sensitive about our work. You know, we take it very personal in our work. And there's a chapter in the book where I talk about how after every gig I had, I would drive for Uber. 
And many, many times I would pick up people from the same club I was DJing at and I would be like, oh, how was your night? What'd you think of the DJ? What'd you think of the music? And they would tell me and I'd listen. I'd say, you know, mm -hmm. by the way, that was me that was DJing there, you know? So thank you for the feedback, I appreciate it. And I just learned so much from what they shared. And I just, it also really helped me kind of manage my ego better so I could be more open for feedback and I would take it less personal. And that, that that's one of my favorite little kind of sub chapters in the book also. Okay. I, I, I really like that because I know it makes a lot, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, I know I keep saying that, but I know that, uh, one of the things that Terry teaches is that you want to make sure you're asking your clients what it is they want and need. And that's kind of what I'm hearing with you with respect to feedback was you made a point of going out and asking your audience, you know, what's working, what's not quite right, so that it would give you the opportunity to give them a better product. Exactly. Yeah. And you have to listen. I mean, we have to really hone our listening skills and you have to be able to maybe ask some even more clarifying questions and just be able to come to a consensus of like, okay, this is what you're looking for. This is what we can improve on. This is what we're doing well. And this is how we're going to move forward together. We're going to make these changes. We're going to keep doing what we're doing in regards to this. And then that's just how you create like a really strong relationship with your clients and you can acquire more clients because if, if they see, okay, he's asking for my feedback, it's going to take my feedback, apply it and improve. Well, that's pretty rare. So I'm definitely going to have this company at the top of mind when it comes time for a referral. And again, uh, I'm definitely seeing the connection between asking for the feedback and building a quality relationship with your audience, your clients, um, <clears throat> certainly in this day of social media, you are building a relationship with your audience as you're building your business, even before you get to the point of them being a client. And so I'm also hearing that you treated your audience much the same way in that the better you listen to them, the better you connected to them you saw it as potential opportunities that they're going to say, well, I was at this club and, you know, Amani was fantastic. You have an event coming up. He's, he's your man. He's the person that you want to have take care of this for you. And that's the same kind of thing when it comes to any kind of business, whether it's a coaching business, a consulting business, that kind of thing, you're still, you can get referrals from people who aren't your clients as well, because while they may not need what you want, if you've treated them well, they're still going to connect and refer you. Yes. Many, many times people will see me at a corporate event. Uh, they'll see me at a club or a bar. I don't know who they are, but they say, you know, I like kind of how you're navigating the night. I like the music you're playing. I like how you interact with the crowd. They have a business card. I love to follow up with you on maybe a potential gig or opportunity to play or DJ. That happens very frequently and you just have to be open and people can tell people are very mm -hmm. smart. They can, many people have high emotional IQ so they can see how you're treating people, looking, eye contact, all these little verbal and vis visual cues. They can tell whether or not you're kind of in it, whether or not you're open to collaborating and then they'll approach you. Which was the most difficult chapter in your book for you to, for you to write? What was the one that challenged you the most? Hmm. I mean, the editing of the book was the biggest challenge, but when I was writing the book, uh, I think, you know, just talking about uh, like mindset, mindset's a very, very difficult topic to talk about because people get a little scared when you talk about it. And during writing the book, I was, my mindset was evolving also because mm. I was, you know, struggling with a little bit of uh, imposter syndrome. Like who am I to be a DJ, you know, 12 or 13 years in the game, writing this book when there's DJs who have two or three times the amount of time in the DJ industry, but they haven't written a book. So it's my time. So I'm going to write the book. So I think mindset was the toughest one because it's an uncomfortable topic. It's a topic that is never like, you're never really done with kind of getting a, a growth mindset. It's always a work in progress. And many, many times there'll be other people, family members, old friends, new friends who have like, you know, the scarcity mindset and they want to try to bring you back into their world, but you can't, you can't submit to that. So that's why I think that the mindset chapter is talking about that different 
tips and tricks you can do to kind of keep your mind right was the most challenging because it was still a work in progress for me at the time of writing. It still is now also. At the end of the day, it's it, we are always continuously evolving and growing. I really loved what you shared there about um, the the imposter syndrome. Who am I to be writing this book? Uh, because I think there's a lot of people who kind of face that. And I mean, and I know it comes back to who are you not to? Because just because somebody has more years in the field doesn't mean that they're the right person to be writing the book that you're going to be writing. Could they write their own book? Absolutely. But it's really about what is it that you are bringing to the table? What is it from your experiences? What are the dots that you've connected? And, and giving an opportunity for somebody to see through your eyes and and be able to see those things and they are absolutely going to get a gift from it so I love that you shared that because I think it's an important thing for our listeners to get that what they bring to the table has value and you don't need to compare yourself to others I think that was fantastic yeah thank you I think you know a really close friend She's a, a yoga instructor, but she's got many years of corporate America and she's been through like some tough times personally. And so we discuss writing a book and she's like, oh, who would want to read a book by me? My story's so original. And that's like a form of imposter syndrome when she's sharing mm -hmm. that. And I'm like, but you don't realize the life that you've lived, the barriers that you've overcome and what you've done. Like people are looking to you for inspiration because there are many people like you who are stuck you're not stuck. So you need to share your story because you can inspire one, two, three, four thousand people to follow in your footsteps. So they need to hear your story. Your story is not a uh, cookie cutter. It's very original. And that's just the mindset we get stuck in. So when you recognize it, you have to try to remind people that we're all original. We all have original paths in life and it needs to be heard. I love that because we certainly didn't, we didn't experience what we experienced in the vacuum. We experienced it in a world and what if what if we had those experiences for a very clear reason and we get the opportunity to make a difference in someone else's life? Sounds like the kind of woman who would look at it from a perspective of I get to be a contribution to someone. And so I love that you encouraged her with that. Um, I just I want to make sure we actually need to pause for a bit of a break here. And then when we come back uh, to the show, I'm going to give Amani an opportunity to share exactly how you can connect with them. So we're just going to take a break right now. Hey there, it's Terry Levine. I just wanted to pop in for just a moment as you're listening here to Heart Entrepreneur Radio and watching Heart Entrepreneur TV. We have so many new and exciting things going on. So you can watch a free masterclass. Highly recommend to get a conveyor belt of qualified prospects. That's at TL, like Terry Levine, TLwebinar.com. Head over there, enjoy it, keep listening and sharing the show. Okay, welcome back to Heart Entrepreneur Radio Show and TV. I'm your co-host, Velma Gallant, and we are here today with Amani Roberts, and we're talking about the connection between a DJ business and growing a business. And so I hope you've been enjoying this. Amani, can you share with us the best place for our listeners to be able to connect with you? Definitely. First, you know, my website, amaniexperience.com. That'll give you immediate access to me. Also socials. They're all at Amani Experience, A like Apple, M like Mary, A like Apple, M like Nancy, I the word experience, all one word. I live stream on Twitch three days a week. That's twitch.tv backslash Amani Experience. And then business wise on LinkedIn, it's just Amani Roberts and you'll put like Amani Roberts and then DJ and I'll pop up there and connect with me anywhere. And I'd love to start a conversation with all of your listeners. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so what is one more thing inside of the DJ business that you see connects to business in general? We've talked about um, the audience and how that connects with our audience and customers. We've talked about um, collaboration. What are some of the other things that you saw connected between your DJ business and all business? I love to talk about just the use of nostalgia. I think nostalgia is a very powerful, uh, emotional way to connect with people. You'll see many businesses 
use it effectively where it is maybe old spice where they use lots of old music in their commercials and their tracks you know attract different and new consumers you'll see adidas use it when they use it nostalgia for their stan smith tennis shoes back in like the 70s when stan smith was a tennis player uh, you'll see nintendo they all they bring back like the old little nintendo systems that people who are now you know a little bit older can introduce that system to their kids so nostalgia is very effective in the dj world when i'm doing my sets i love to play slow jams slow music from maybe throwbacks back in the day where it'll remind people when they were in high school college had less worries less stress it just kind of brightens the mood it's been known mm -hmm. to really kind of chemically raise your spirits and i think that using nostalgia is just a really extremely effective way for businesses to find new customers uh re-engage with current and old customers and just be creative and so i really love nostalgia as another aspect we discuss in the book i i really like that because what, I, what i'm hearing is is it is you're using nostalgia to create a stronger connection and build a relationship a stronger relationship with your audience as well definitely i think you know for me nostalgia the last 15 minutes of a set i'll try to slow play slow it down play a little uh, mid to low tempo music just to kind of help people get people out of the club, but also to just kind of have them leaving on a high because like, oh, I remember this song when I was this year, this many years old and, you know, I was doing this and doing that and they sing along and kind of end the night that way. It just really helps. It's something I love to do. And I see businesses use that same concept where with their advertising, with their promotions, and it's extremely effective. And you'll notice like a lot of the most successful commercials and most popular commercials that win awards always have some aspect of music in them. And primarily the music is always like a throwback. It's like a music from back in the day that crosses over many different age uh, demographics that draws in people who are 60, 70, 30, 40, 50, 20s. Because many times people nowadays will discover music that's old, but they discover it through commercials. And that's all by the use of nostalgia. And so I just love it. Okay, I like that. I like that. It's kind of, um, it reminds me of some of the musicians out there that are bringing in some of the, the older musicians and doing a collaboration with them. And it's, it was kind of funny, because some of them, it was like, so and so is so nice to bring in this other person and lift them up. And it's like, dude, he's been around forever. Yeah, for <laughs> yes, yes, yes. That's so for Holland Oates did a, a great collaboration with CeeLo. They redid the, you know, I can't go for that, but they did it with CeeLo. That's an example. When you talk about that story, that makes me think of that because that's a lot of the younger people know CeeLo, but they don't know Hall and Oates, but then they discovered Hall and Oates. So like, oh, this is interesting. It's funny because a lot of times they're like, well, who, why is, uh, what they'll say, they'll say, who is this Hall and Oates and why are they singing a CeeLo song? Like they get it reversed. Like they think the newer artist is singing the original song. They're like, well, why is this old artist singing this new song? They're like, no, 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 that is their song. So it's just funny. <laughs> it, it is funny. You know, and it kind of, it kind of brings me to, um, there's a few out there that there's nothing new in the world. We're just actually uh, repackaging it or remixing it. And, and I think that too, when it comes to some of our products, is it a value for us to take some of the products that we've had and make, remix them together and come out with something new and, and valuable? Because sometimes those combinations can create more value for our listeners, for our clients as well. You'll see like a lot of consumer goods companies do that. I think Coca-Cola, they might have had for fun. They had like the 25th or 30th anniversary of New Coke, just as fun because back in the day they launched New Coke. It was not successful at all. But then they used this 25th anniversary just to kind of remix it, launch it again for fun, not expecting a lot of sales. You'll see that. You'll see a lot of movies get relaunched the 25th anniversary. So they'll re like re-record it with maybe more high definition in it, or they'll remix a song that are just new songs that are in the movie. So that's a really common strategy for brands to do, take their most successful products and relaunch them the 25th anniversary, the 10th anniversary, because people love an anniversary. They love like memories. And that's mm -hmm. just another example of kind of how consumer goods companies do that. That's kind of cool because I think there's a lot more connections between music, DJing and, and business than a lot of us would even think about. 
because yeah, that remixing thing kind of popped in while we were talking mm-hmm. about all of this. I'm like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense because that's, and, and I know that's something that Terry teaches as well in, inside of her work is about repurposing. So you might have, you know, you might have podcasts and then you have the transcripts and those can be turned into blog posts and, 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 and so the same kind of thing absolutely applies to any kind of business as well as a DJ business. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, indeed. I agree. (laughs) Okay. So what is another important thing inside of your book that you think is of value for our listeners to connect to? We've talked about um, your troubleshooting chapter. We've talked about your feedback. Um, You mentioned about the mindset. You did mention about managing your ego and growing your listening skills. What else do you think would be really important for our listeners to connect to? I also have a section where I kind of give, I think it's like seven tips of just really how to grow your DJ business. One of them we talked about already was collaborating with other DJs. Mm -hmm. Another tip would be to get education, take lessons. I think that's really important that help broaden your skill set, which is, which is valuable. And then something that I really doubled down on is just joining professional associations. I think in the DJ world, that's kind of a hidden uh gym many DJs don't take advantage of that i'm very active in professional associations two in particular uh, meeting professionals international on the global level as well as my chapter which is southern california so i'm very active with that and then ascap and ascap is more on the music recording side and you can get immense amount of education through these associations the networking is very valuable because you're working and networking with like-minded people who can refer you business but also you know, being a small business owner can be very lonely. And in a lot of mm-hmm. these different associations, you have people who are doing similar things, whether it be small boutique uh, event planning companies, uh, video videographers, small boutique venues. It's always good to be around people who are kind of in the same fight as you. And you can meet these people. You can learn from them. You can share what you're going through. They, they can share what they're going through. You can find out current events and news from them. So I just really, really encourage you know, DJs, creatives to join professional associations. You can attend the national conferences, then see what what kind of explorers you can get globally. I think that most, many of us creatives don't take advantage of that, but we should because it's very valuable. And so there's a chapter that talks about that and just gives more tips with regards to that too. Okay, those are really great tips because I think it doesn't matter which business you're in, you Mm -hmm. wanna stay on top of, you know, the education that you need because, it, things always evolve and we want to be evolved. We want our business to evolve because sometimes it's just more effective for us to evolve as our clients evolve, right? So you want to keep educating yourself so you have more to offer your clients. And the networking, I think, is super important. I love that you're talking about different professional associations and connecting with people that are doing either exactly what you're doing or similar to what what you're doing and and creating that opportunity for learning from each other. I remember years ago talking with somebody who was wanting to build a business and I'm like, you don't have to talk to your competitors here. You can talk to your competitors on the other side of the country and they will, they'll, they'll be, you know, they'll feel good that you've connected with them and felt that they were big enough that you wanted to learn from them. They're not going to be threatened by you because you're not actually in their physical location. So you're not going to be direct competition. So yeah, you probably can learn a lot from somebody like that. So networking in some of these uh, professional associations, I think is super valuable for us because there's a lot of opportunities to mentor and be mentored. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. I think it's just, just a, it has to be like a daily practice and then you'll, mm-hmm. it'll pay benefits and dividends well into the future. Well into the future. And I think too, you know, much like what, what you're talking about with, with collaborating with other DJs, because there's a lot of genres of music. There are a lot of different types of events that you guys take care of. And so, you know, you're going to be, an expert in this area. But if somebody approaches you and says, well, I need somebody, 
that can do this and it's and it's not your expertise could you do it yeah you could but it's not your expertise you have options because if you're collaborating with somebody you have the opportunity to you know pay it forward and pass the business on to someone else and then they can do the same has that been your experience in in your business specifically yeah yeah you you definitely described a common occurrence someone could say you know we're having an event here and we really want to focus on like we our CEO loves house music and he loves like old school Chicago house. So we really want to have that as the focus of the music that we're playing throughout the event. I could do that. I could research old school house and do that. Or I can refer that to a colleague of mine who that's all they know. So they would be able to play all the obscure cuts and all the obscure house music and just really, really make a great impression on the CEO because that's the important music for them. So you have to, have the growth mindset that, okay, just because I'm referring this piece of business to this DJ, I'm going to get two or three other bigger, even a better fit business for me. That's tough at first, especially when you're trying to kind of uh, grow your business and get as much revenue as possible. But in the long run, that'll be the best decision because you're going to make that client look good and they're going to keep coming back to you. Well, and, and so I'm hearing, I'm hearing a couple of things there. One, you don't have to make the financial investment into getting the right music for them. Mm-hmm. So you're sure you might have some income come in, but you're going to have a good chunk of that income going out because you're expanding your music list. Um, you're building a great relationship with that other DJ because now if that other DJ has somebody come to him and he knows you're the expert for what they're looking for. He's going to absolutely refer them over to you because he knows you do the same. It makes him look good. It makes you look good. That client, that potential client that you ended up referring out is going to come to you when they know one, they want the music that you've got, or who do you know? You become that, that circle of knowledge that they want to tap into. Yeah, yeah, indeed. That's how it works. And then your network grows and you get more opportunities and you just keep moving forward. So that's exactly how that works. Awesome. Awesome. So, uh, Amani, I think we are at at the end of our time. This went really fast. I thoroughly (laughs) enjoyed this. It was so fascinating to see the overlay of the DJ business onto um, any kind of business and how there are so many connections there. I know that our listeners have got a super amount of value from you. And I want to, again, make sure that our listeners know how to connect with you. Definitely. uh, AmaniExperience.com is the website at Amani Experience across all the socials. LinkedIn is Amani Roberts. You can find the book on Amazon. Just type in DJs mean business. It'll pop up there. Um, And you can also check out my podcast, which is the Imani Experience Podcast on Spotify, Apple, Stitcher, YouTube, all the places. And if you ever get want to try a new platform, you can watch me streaming live on Sundays, Mondays and Wednesdays, twitch.tv backslash Imani Experience. Brilliant. Thank you so much for your time, Imani. I loved our conversation. This was amazing. And thank you to our listeners for joining us. Be sure to go to Facebook. Uh, and look up Heartpreneurs with Terry Levine. You're going to be able to connect with more heart-based business owners there. Please like, subscribe, and we always love those five-star reviews. Thanks again, Amani. This was fantastic. It was a pleasure. Thank you. You've been listening to Heartrepreneur Radio, maximizing your personal and business results by leading with your heart with your host, Terry Levine. This show is produced every week for your enjoyment and education. To make sure you never miss a single show, add us to your favorite RSS feed or subscribe in iTunes. You can also read Terry's latest blog posts at www.heartrepreneur.com slash blog. Or follow Terry on Twitter at MentorTerry and on Facebook.com slash Heartrepreneur Terry Levine. Your questions and comments are always welcome and appreciated. Send them to Terry on either Facebook or Twitter. Thank you for listening.